Author and essayist Margaret Wrinkle casts a poet's gaze on the landscape of the American South and its complicated, often contradictory, culture. In her New York Times columns and her collections of essays, she reflects on family and the passage of time in the plant and animal world while drawing parallels to our own human experience. After reading Wrinkle's newest book, The Comfort of Crows, you may never see your backyard or your neighborhood park in quite the same way. We can't go back and undo the Industrial Revolution, but we can notice what we're losing right before our very eyes. The Comfort of Crows consists of 52 chapters divided by seasons. You might call it a literary devotional, one that can be savored over time in small lyrical bites. Margaret Renkel, so good to have you here today to talk about The Comfort of Crows. Thank you for having me, Kathy. I really loved your book. I'm going to hold it up so everyone can see it. It's a beautiful book. Um, has a very unique structure for a book of essays, 52 short chapters, which really could be read over the course of a year. Can you talk a little bit about the structure of the book and how you decided to do this collection of essays in this way? When I was on book tour with my first book, Late Migrations. It's also an essay collection. It also includes artwork by my brother, Billy Wrinkle, the collage artist. And the book tour was a, there was a lot of in and out. Like I would go out for two days and come back, and go out. So it, it, it really, it went on and on. for. And by the end of my travels, I was meeting people who had already read the book. And they were, they were saying to me over and over again, um, I've started reading this very slowly. I don't want to hurry. I want, it's helping me slow down. I'm trying to parcel out just one a night or two a night. And I remember thinking after about the millionth time that happened that it would be really fun to write a book that was meant to be read that way. That if it was helping people slow down, if it was helping people settle and 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 just be a little calmer and a little less anxious, you know, who wouldn't want that? And then somebody said to me, it's almost like, I'm reading it almost like a devotional. And it brought back all those memories of my grandmother and my great grandmother in their upper room magazine reading one spiritual meditation a day. And it just sort of helps, it helped them, I think, set the day, you know, just kind of either start out with the right frame of mind or end in a calmer, more comfortable place. And that's when I really started thinking about it, because by the time I was thinking about that, we were deep into the middle of a very scary pandemic. Um, I wrote the proposal for this book in April and May of 2020. So it was a it was a an anxious time. But also I remembered reading Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. I remembered reading Walden by Henry David Thoreau. There were a number of predecessors to this book that made it feel like I was participating in a literary tradition. Just the idea that we experience the seasons in the same way that the other creatures experience the seasons by observing and smelling and hearing and that is such a comfort to me and I and I thought maybe it might be for readers as well. There's a whole raft of books that do this. They don't they're not writing from a first ring suburb in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm thinking about Stu <laughs> Hubble's uh, Country Year or Verlin mm -hmm. Klinkenborg's The Rural Life and certainly Annie Dillard, that the ecosystems would be very different, the creatures very different, but the feeling of kinship was the same. This is a collection of essays about nature, but it's about much more than nature. Um, and it was interesting you mentioned writing this from an inner ring suburb of Nashville. 
I think anybody who lives, you know, in a normal suburban sort of area, maybe doesn't live in the country, will find a lot of solace in this book and start to look at their backyard in a new way. As you said, it's an ecosystem. If you stop and you think about it and you really look at it, there's a whole you know, system of life going on out there. And you're so good at identifying that and naming that in here. Well, I thank you. That's, those are very kind words. Um, I do write from the perspective of a rank amateur though. I'm not, um, I'm not trained in any science. I don't, I don't have any expertise in observation and recording my observations. It's just a, a natural habit of mine. And, and in some ways, that's a little, I don't know, I, I think there's a little bit of a, a, a kind of hubris involved in um, setting out to write a book of, about nature from a position of s such great ignorance. But I think... Um, <laughs> It doesn't I, seem like you have great ignorance. But I, I, mean, I think this is a lot of research. and I do a lot of reading, and I do a lot of looking up in field guides, but it's not the same thing. It's no, it's no substitution for true science training. I was just going to say that's one of the things that's so delightful about it is that I feel like I really could name all those flowers in my wildflowers in my yard and the little things that bloom in the clover and all of this um if i just studied a little bit and the birds you know we have bird feeders and i don't i don't really assign a name to them but in the naming you know is sort of a nice thing that you do in here there's something that happens when you name the different species and you you know their characteristics there is something very i think um human about naming like, I don't think the creatures, I don't know this for sure, but I don't think the creatures in my yard or yours are out there naming each other. But they recognize one another. They know one another. They recognize individuals and, of course, whole species. The songbirds will always mob up. It's called a songbird mob. They'll mob up when there's an owl in the yard or a hawk in the yard. They um, cooperate. So I think they do know one another and they do recognize really crucial facets of the, the other species um, way of being in the world, but we tend not to. And I just find that so interesting. You know, we talk in, in um, nature writing about how, how terrible it is to anthropomorphize nature, but I don't feel that I have any real great temptation to do that because I think that they are so interesting in and of themselves <laughs> like they just their mm -hmm. weird alien yeah. ways are so fascinating to me <laughs> but when you give something a name it does become your neighbor if not your friend you talk a lot here in the book about sort of how we've all become so removed from nature you know you can easily today it's winter you know i could go home get in my garage get in my house never really step outside and have that experience and so part of your book is a call to stop and kind of look at some of that is that intentional absolutely intentional because i i sit here in my little home office and there's a window and I see my neighbors walking around. And so even when we're in the world, we're so rarely in it. You know, we're looking at our phones. We have our earbuds in, listening to a podcast or music. And we aren't hearing the birds. And we aren't noticing the other creatures with whom we share this habitat. And I, and I think that's a very, to a very large degree, our problem as a species, because we, we can't go back and undo the industrial revolution, but we can notice what we're losing right before our very eyes. I, you know, I, I just think if we don't notice, we won't take measures to change ourselves in our world. You talk a lot about every time that a, a small house or a house with a real natural sort of yard, you know, goes up for sale or one of your elderly neighbors passes away and the house changes over. There's a lot of tear down and building something new. And with that comes a very tended yard and lawn with maybe some chemicals. And you talk, a, I mean, this isn't a preachy book by any stretch of the imagination, but it's written from the point of view of someone who observes that loss. The, the whole problem with a lawn, there's so many problems with the American lawn. It, 
We don't generally um, think about those problems, though, because the, the problems are marketed to us in innocuous ways. For example, you, you use the word chemical, and I use the word chemical as well, but really what we're talking about is poison. We're talking about chemicals that are designed to kill weeds or to kill seeds before they can germinate. And those poisons, we aren't thinking of them as dangerous to the creatures who share our ecosystems, and we're certainly not thinking that they're dangerous to us. If we thought they were dangerous to us, they wouldn't be anywhere near us. But so many times you see the same people who are driving to Whole Foods to buy organic milk, letting their children run barefoot across lawns that have been absolutely drenched with poison. And you'll see these little bitty signs that the lawn services will leave around next to the mailbox that says the lawn is feeding or the lawn has been treated and um, stay off until it's dry as those, those as though those chemicals disappear when they dry or mm -hmm. as though they don't mm -hmm. renew their um, potency when they get rained on. So it's, um, I think a lot of our failure to understand what's happening is, is just because our culture is designed to make sure we don't understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And nobody who goes to Home Depot or Lowe's to the lawn care aisle and who sees the picture of the green grass on the fertilizer, nobody is thinking to themselves, oh, why don't I kill some bugs so that the baby birds in my yard have nothing to eat or have only poisoned insects to eat? We don't think that. We don't know that's what we're doing. We're just um, busy. I think we're all just busy. What does your yard look like? I found myself wondering as I read your book. <laughs> A lot of leaves right now? If I showed you my yard, you would be very disappointed. It is, <laughs> it is um, scraggly, and we've been in our house for... 28 and a half years. And it looks really different now than it did when we first moved in. When we first moved in, it was grass and it was privet and it was Nandina. Um, the, the things that were fashionable when this house was built in 1950, we don't mow. We let the wildflowers spring up, the, the spring beauties and the violets and the oxalis and even the dandelions because the bees that emerge in early springtime they will have nothing to eat if everybody kills the what they think of as weeds because the traditional gardens aren't blooming yet in early march but the spring beauties and the woodland violets um they're they're there the daisy fleabane they're there and and we only mow the parts of the yard that we use I try to keep a balance between what I know my wild neighbors need and what my human neighbors would prefer. And I, right. I try to find a nice little balance there. And the leaves fall there. We have so many lightning bugs. Um, you may call them fireflies in your part of the world. But sir, Light, oh, we call them lightning, lightning bugs. Lightning bugs. The lightning bugs, some, there are some species of lightning bugs where they live in the leaf litter for a couple of years as larvae. So if you rake your leaves or you mulch them with a power mower, you, you end up killing the lightning bugs. And so there's a lot of life that comes from leaf litter. But if you can't do the the leave it everywhere. If you can't leave the leaves everywhere, you can make a leaf area or you can make, you could leave them in the flower beds. I don't think you have to think to yourself, I have to do this completely or there's no point in doing it at all. And it's, this is an easy call to make. You know, we, we can't easily feed 8 billion people without chemicals, but we can easily change what we think is beautiful in the context of our nearby nature, our city parks and our um, own yards and the strip of grass that grows between the sidewalk and the street. We can change those things so easily, save money, save time, and save our wild neighbors. And it is very comforting to be able to do something. 
I like to think of it as kind of a gateway drug, like bird feeders. Once you know that they're the birds that are there, then you think, okay, what can I plant that will feed these birds? What what can I? It's a cascading effect, and and I think that's not because you you're doing the right thing, even though you are. I think it's because you're doing something that makes you feel good. And we don't ever do anything just because we should do it. Very, very few of us just keep doing a hard thing because we should. We do a hard thing because we see a benefit to it. We think it's helpful. And I don't think you can underestimate the power of your individual yard, my individual yard, my neighbors, your neighbors, their neighbors. The collective effect of individual action is the same thing as a sea change. I mean, everything that's ever happened for the good in this country has happened because people did that. Can you tell us about crows and why you like crows so much? They are incredibly smart. They can outwit nearly all efforts to dissuade them from a crop or from any other place that we don't want them to be. But the, the thing about crows and the reason I find them comforting, the whole reference to, to the, in the, in the, it's not a book about crows, no. but what it is is a book about kinship, mm -hmm. about the way we're connected to our wild neighbors and to each other. And you see that more transparently with crows. In the world of nearby nature, they have the largest brain-to-body ratio of any thing in the wild kingdom except for us and the great apes. They're incredibly clever. They're, they have a sense of humor. They play. They engage in play behavior even as adults. When m many higher order animals play as youngsters, but crows play as adults. Um, I talk about several examples of crows sledding or wind surfing or playing tricks on one another. They hold a grudge. They conduct funerals. They live together in multi-generational families. All those things that we think of as human traits, crows also share. And it's very reassuring to be reminded that we belong to this world in some of the same ways. For me, that's true anyway. I, I have to mention the beautiful beautiful artwork in the book. This is your brother's work, your brother Billy. Yes. What was it like to collaborate with him on this? Well, Billy is only a year younger than I am. So in many ways, we've been collaborating for his entire life and my entire memory. We were, you know, part of that generation where we were not as closely supervised, let us say, <laughs> as children today are. <laughs> as long as we stayed together, you know, on the buddy system, mm -hmm. we could go pretty much anywhere we could take ourselves and where we took ourselves was the was the woods and the fields so in some ways billy grew up tuned to the same things that i grew up tuned to the same flowers the same birds the same trees but it's um it's just something we've always done we we worked on school publications high school college he was the art director i was the editor we um we made little I don't know, little cards and booklets for our parents and grandparents, and then later for our high school college friends. So it was really easy to work with Billy because we had been working together our whole lives. And also, I just, um, insofar as it's possible to stay out of something like that, I tried to stay out of it. Um, Billy, if you got Billy on, he might say I didn't stay out of it as successfully <laughs> as I would. But I trusted him. I, I trusted his aesthetic. I trusted his ability to see what I was trying to do and to create another way in to that same world. My, my way in is through words. His way in is through images. Where do you write? It's about to change. Um, this little office is the room that should have been the walk-in closet um, off our bedroom. 
and I and I used it primarily when my when my children were growing up. I I hid away back here behind three closed doors, <laughs> but once my youngest child went to college, I started working out in our family room because the table that they had you my husband built this just plywood table for them to make art um, to, for all those art projects small children do and then later that was where we, they kept their computers during their, and did their homework and when my our youngest left for college I took it over because it looks right out over one of the pollinator gardens oh, nice. but it also looks right over my next door neighbor's house and she died in the spring and her family sold the house and it got torn down last week and it's about to be very loud out there so i'm going to move back in here i was mainly using this office to do things like answer emails and try in my mind if i could keep the writing separate from the businessy part of being a writer it would be easier to dive back into a project it would be easier to get my mind in that space but i'm going to have to find another way of doing that this year What's your writing habit like? This past year, I have not had much of a habit, I have to admit. Um, I try to divide the weeks up so that I have Monday and Tuesday to write my own work. And the work I do for the New York Times, I do on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, in, in my ideal scenario, I work on the writing or the reading, if I'm, if for the times I have to do a lot of reading, because I read about a lot of different things and some of them I don't know anything about. So I have to inform myself. Um, I try to do that before I answer emails or because it's just better. I, I used to say first things first. You know, I'm going to save my, um, my freshest brain for the hardest work, which is mm -hmm. writing. But mm -hmm. Um, it's very easy for a certain kind of procrastinator to feel that you're getting something done if you're answering an email or, and you know, and so it doesn't feel like procrastination, but the emails never f are never done. You're never caught up. So I, my 2024 New Year's resolution when I will not be on book tour and, and thinking about how to help a new book reach readers i'll i'll be working on something new i don't know what it is yet but i i hope i can go back to the first things first i'm glad you mentioned your new york times columns because i i didn't want to neglect to mention that i've been following you for a long time in those columns it's a nice little break from most of the other things on the opinion pages <laughs> especially now you know to read a, a nice thoughtful essay that makes you slow down a little bit and about the natural world or your connection to it or what's going on in your life, you know, at a particular point. Have you been doing those for a long time? My first piece for the Times ran in 2015. And then I was writing just occasionally whenever I had something, because I had a full-time job as an editor. Um, and maybe, maybe three times a year, maybe four. But by 2017, I was writing every week. You know, sometimes people will say to me, I, what I love about you is that I can run all the way down the whole list of headlines, and yours is the only one that doesn't have the words Donald Trump in the headline. <laughs> and but, but they don't need me to do that writing. They have plenty of people who comment on national politics. I do write about politics um, here in the South um, when I need to when something particularly egregious is going on in the world of social justice. But, um, but generally I'm, I'm more focused on the natural world, on culture, on um, those quieter, slower things. Did you write while you were an editor? I went to graduate school in creative writing. So my intention had always been to write, but I also was a poet in those days and you know, even when you're 20 years old, that you're never going to support yourself as a poet or that very few are, and you probably won't be one of them. And so for the first 10 years out of, out of school, I was a high school teacher. And then I was a full-time writer for national magazines. And then I took an editing job and I did do some writing, 
quite a bit of writing for the, the website Chapter 16, which is a literary publication. You published your first collection of essays a little bit later in life than a lot of people do. Very late. How did that all, very <laughs> late. How, how did that all happen? It's very encouraging, by the way. Uh, well, it's encouraging to people our age and not at all yeah. encouraging to young writers. They, they do not want to hear they that, get it, enough. They get enough. <laughs> that they might be 57 years old before their first book comes out. I think it's a lot of reasons. I think um, I wasn't writing I, when I was teaching. I was writing mainly in the, in the summers. My goal during the school year was one poem a month. So I wasn't highly productive during those years. And then when I was writing for magazines, I didn't want to, that was, that was paying my share of the bills. I didn't have time to step away and from income to do, conduct a, a long, longer project like this. But then I think too, that part of, part of it was just, I wish somebody had told me that the secret to being a writer is, is not to have vast stretches of free time in which to write. The secret to being a writer is just to write within the context you're in. And if you're just doing even the smallest amount, a little bit, I wrote Late Migrations the, in the beginning, the first draft of it, I wrote in probably 15 minutes a day. I just gave myself permission for the first 15 minutes of the day before anybody else was awake in the house to write something I was going through a lot. My mother had just died. My mother-in-law was dying. My father-in-law was uh, failing too. And my children were growing up. There was a lot going on. And 15 minutes a day was all I could spare. But the great thing about writing every single day, even if it's only 15 minutes, is that there's this thing happening in your mind to solve problems, to think of the next thing, the ideas cascade out when your brain is occupied with that work, even when you're just doing something ordinary like folding laundry or loading the dishwasher, walking the dog. So it, I think it's, um, I think it took a long time because it took me a long time to discover that truth. I think I heard you say something about you would tell your students the way to, you know, be a writer is to write, and when you can't write, walk. <laughs> that, that's that's <laughs> what it's all boiled down to. I do teach now. Um, that wasn't something I knew when I was a full-time teacher, but when I'm teaching writing workshops or as a visiting writer, I just there's something about walking that shakes something loose in me, and I think in most people. Stop and think for a time about kinship. Think for a long time about kinship. The world lies before you, a lavish garden. However hobbled by waste, however fouled by graft and tainted by deception, it will always take your breath away. We were never cast out of Eden. We merely turned from it and shut our eyes to return and be welcomed cleansed and redeemed, we are only obliged to look. Thank you so much. That's so beautiful and lyrical and I can, I can hear the poetry. <laughs> Thanks.